So something that starts off microscopically turns into this little bud. And some of them will be as small as like the thumb on your hand to as big as like your foot to your knee. Um, like the, uh, uh, was it the king mushroom? They were one of the larger ones uh, that you'll find a lot of gardeners will use for their homes. Um, get very large like that, where they're really good at digesting and breaking stuff down. And that's one application. Um, and we have all these, these different uh, uh, fungi that, um, you know, they start really small. Some of them kind of work nomadically. But one of the things that's been popping up recently with research is the connectivity that, that I was talking about. And what, that, what they found in the last five-ish, 10-ish years is there's a connection between the plants that you see outside, the trees that you see outside, everything that creates the soil, part of what's keeping that connected is mycelia. It's, it's the fungus that's, that's keeping it connected. And what's happening there is the mycelia, the root system, the, some people will call it the mycorrhizal connection, some people will call it the mycelial connection. Basically what they're talking about is the root system. Other people will call those specific parts the hyphae. It's kind of ambiguous as to what the actual root part of each piece is, uh, depending on which expert you ask. But basically what you're looking at is mushrooms make a in, in the ground. And we'll go everywhere. We'll go from this tree to this bush, to this grass, to that compost bin, to this grass over here, to this bush over here. And what's going to happen is as that that spread starts to go on, it's going to basically turn into this bartering system where the mushroom is going to go, okay, I can eat this thing here and I can metabolize really well and get this mulch pile and I'm going to break. Hey, hey, bro, hey, bro your Wi-Fi is, 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 is acting spotty. I think the further you get from your house, the more it's going to uh, uh, destabilize. Matter of fact, yeah. I don't know what's the way I see you. Are you on all red here? I can't hear nothing you're saying, but it's all me? good. Can, can I, you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Or what, is it coming in? I can hear you. Like it's still spotty, but I can hear you. Okay. So right here, can you see that on the picture? Yeah. You, you got a stick you're digging through. Yeah, yeah. So right here is mulch. Right here. Those little root structures right there, mm -hmm. that's, that's the mycelia that I'm talking about. So you get a big, big pile like this that would take forever and a day to break down. I mean, we're talking, you know, if it was like just a broken down uh, fallen tree, it could take a year or longer to break down. But once that fungi gets in there, it starts metabolizing really quickly. And what it ends up happening is it makes that connection with all those different plants and sees, okay, who needs nitrogen? Who needs, who needs heavy metals? Who needs carbon source? Who needs potassium? And then what ends up happening is that very simple fungus that's making this connection starts exchanging with everybody and says, okay, you get this, you get that, everybody's happy. And basically you get this really happy connection with, ev with everything. Because the thing is like, think about it like this. It's, it's like if you were to, to plant a garden in the middle of a parking lot, you could feed that garden, it could do really well, but it's still gonna be a garden stuck in the middle of a parking lot. Whereas if you filled that parking lot with soil and then took that plant out of the pot and then stuck it in there, now all of a sudden it has this huge community to. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. 
So yeah, so oh, I hope you get back. There you go. All right, let's stay like like this. It was it, it went out for a second. You're saying that uh, if you take a plan and put it inside of a community, then oh yeah. So when you put it into a community, then what ends up happening is you have you have community. You have uh, nutrients being exchanged. You have water being exchanged. You have bacteria. Um, and that's what they're finding more and more is that, you know, like the same way that like, if you look at, uh, plants becoming resistant to certain applications of, uh, you know, heat temperatures, uh, or, or, you know, different climate things occurring to them. I mean, it's all stuff about resiliency and making it better. And that's, that's what comes down to composting where the healthier and the more biodiverse your soil is the easier it's going to be for not only that soil to be there when the plant needs it, but also it's going to make it so that the plant can do its own thing without having to constantly be like, okay, well, I need to, to water every single minute or, I mean, you know, every hour on the hour or, or twice a day. Like eventually you end up creating a, a climate system of support that's all around that plant. I mean, the same, like, like the same way that, um, so, so, Going back to, um, hey, pause. Somebody said, hey, somebody said, hey, you you making people dizzy walking around somewhere. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, so like like one of the things. Uh, uh, trying to think of a, a nice way to say this. So like one of the things, uh, being from Brazil, like a lo a lot of people, scientists, whatever, like to fetishize the idea of like the Amazon is this unique ecosystem where you have things, these trees that only thrive in this one tiny location or this one plant matter or this one insect or animal or whatever. That's, that's amazing. That's beautiful. But at the same time, each and every plant that you are working with outside, they have their own unique climate. They have their own unique community. And when you disturb that, then you need to address that and how to fix that. And one of the ways to keep that going is to make sure that it's being fed proper. So like the same way that like, you know, if, if you were like, you know, eating a really good diet, really balanced out, constantly hydrating yourself. And then all of a sudden you were to eat nothing but like, you know, chips or just whatever random like processed thing, you would start feeling it. So the same way that, that, that we respond to good intake, positive outtake, the same way your plant is going to respond to, you know, the, the same things, proper amounts of hydration, proper food, you know, good digestion of, of stuff. And all that comes back to, to composting because it's making sure that the plants getting those vital nutrients, getting plenty of moisture, uh, getting oxygen, because that's one of, that's one of the big things for, for composting is you've got your, your oxygen, you've got your water, you've got your carbon, and then you've got your nitrogen. I mean, those are the fundamental parts. But at the same time, when we were talking about different types of composting, some types, some modalities don't use those things. So like, if we're gonna be doing aerobic versus anaerobic. So aerobic means there's gonna be oxygen, anaerobic means there's no oxygen. Another way to think about that is typically anaerobic composting is going to be referring to uh, ferments, uh, stuff that, that you're fermenting, things that you're trying to remove oxygen from. So like anybody who's doing kombucha, who's drinking kombucha, um, there's a really good book here talking about that stuff, uh, Jadam. It's talking about Korean natural farming. And in there, they're talking specifically about uh, lab which is a uh, shorthand for uh, lactic acid bacteria. And it, lactic acid bacteria is this bacteria that's all around us all the time. It's on our skin. It's on the food we eat. It's, it's part of our bodies. It's, you know, all over the place. And the idea is you harness it relatively simple like this. This was a rice wash. All I did was I made some rice, washed it, 
the water that I washed it with, I stuck in a jar. This took, uh, what was it, five days? I mean, realistically, I should have done three days. So like I'm starting to get like some, some other moldy stuff on top. But if you look carefully, you see that white filament? That is the, uh, the lactic acid bacteria slowly starting to build on there. And basically what it is, is it's like a really simple uh, starches, sugars, and the bacteria is just like, oh, cool, I want to eat that. But then what you do is you end up adding it to milk. Here it's just wash, water, that's it, leftover water. Then when you're doing it into here, what you're going to do is a 10 to 1 ratio. So I have 500, uh, was it 500 um, uh, milliliters? No, not milliliters. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. Five, the 500 on the, on the mason jar bottle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's not liters because that's a lot of 500 liters would be a lot. Yeah, yeah. And it's not ounces because that's <laughs> <laughs> so it's milliliters. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, no, good. Um, and then right here, I've got a shot glass, 30 milliliters. So I want to do 50. So you want to do a 10 to one. Um, so I've got the 500 milliliters to 50 milliliters here. And I'm going to put 50 milliliters of rice wash dumped into here. And then I'm going to dump it into this. It's going to go into here. It's going to mix. I'm going to leave it there for about five days, most likely with this heat, it's going to make itself in about three days, maybe four, and it's going to turn into this. So this I made back in the April, yeah, April 20th. Um, and this is lactic acid bacteria. This is what it looks ah. like. Now, wow. when I ate it, look, there's this little white stuff here. That was all cheese. That was basically what ends up happening here the milk starts to separate and then you get cheese on the top and then on the bottom you get lactic acid bacteria. So when people are making cheese, they throw this stuff away like crazy. But then you get people who like us who do garden stuff and we figure out, wait a minute, I can do something with that. So what ends up happening is you get this and this, I mean, and this is an operation that like altogether, if it was even a dollar's worth of product, when I use this or, or when you use it in general, you use it a thousand to one ratio. So you use a tiny, tiny little bit of this into a gallon, like, like a teaspoon or something like something crazy like that. Mix it into a gallon of water that is either distilled or rainwater. Or if it's tap water, just make sure that it sits for at least a day because you want to get rid of the, um, the uh, chlorine and chloramine. You mix those together and you start spraying that into your soil. The reason you're spraying it into your soil is what I was talking about earlier is that everything you want everything to be about digestion. You want everything to break down efficiently. Hey, let me pause you real quick. Let me let me throw this out here real quick. Somebody was like, "Yo, I didn't think that I could that they could uh, compost meat or dairy." So um, before you go too deep and past this point, insert something that talks about you know safety with composting. You know what I'm saying and like the whole like mo rodents right. and, and pests and putting meat or dairy right. inside of your compost and how hot it needs to get and all that stuff. Okay. So if I'm doing a worm bin like this, and this is super simple, holes on it, coconut choir left over from the coconut industry, and then worm. In here, I'm throwing in vegetables. I'm throwing eggshells. I'm throwing some, uh, some peels like this, just a, a little bit of citrus peels. And then I'm letting it break down. See something in here that I threw in here? Didn't agree and it got a little bit moldy. Ideally, you don't wanna have mold in there. As far as meat and vegetable, or I'm sorry, meat and dairy, you don't wanna use it in your worm bin because what ends up happening is it'll get really moldy and really gross very quickly and it'll kill your worms. It'll make a hot mess. So when we're talking about meat and stuff like that, um, it, you know, even if we're talking about like manure, um, 
they're what call there's they're what what is called vectors of disease. So basically, they will create really bad pathogens very quickly. Uh, so like, uh, what was it? A few years back when we had the was it uh, the lettuce and tomatoes here in the states that everyone got really sick from? Uh -huh. At least one of those cases, I remember they said it was like a pig farm that was right next to the spot where they were growing the vegetables. That basically means that pig crap, who shit, manure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, Let's keep it foggy, man. <laughs> pig shit. <laughs> so basically pig shit got too close to stuff that was consumable. And guess what? People got sick. Uh, in some cases, people get salmonella and other places, other, or not salmonella, salmonella, E. coli, other bacteria like that. Those are things that can really happen with using meats. The way to mitigate that from happening, to, to keep that from, from happening in the first place is uh, like Theron was talking about feet. So the general rule of thumb is if you're going to do a compost bin and you're going to be adding in meats, then you want to have what's referred to as a hot bin. Hot bin means that you're going to have temperatures over 100 degrees. Ideally, they're going to hit 120 degrees for at least three days. Even though that sounds like a lot, it really isn't because you can is basically the way to get heat is the finer the material is, and specifically, I'm talking about the carbon material that I was referring to earlier. Carbon and nitrogen are what you're looking at with your compost. Carbon is going to be the uh, leaves, the coconut choir that I was showing earlier in the bin. Comes in uh, these bricks that you can get uh, that you break down. Comes in coffee chaff that you can get like this from uh, all the roasters that are in town. Comes from you know anybody who's doing uh, home brewing at home the hops, the spent grains that you're using, comes from your shredded leaves, comes from your shredded twigs and branches, you know, that are hanging around your house, comes from a mulch that's breaking down. And the idea is the bigger it is, the longer it's gonna take. The more ground up it is, the quicker it's gonna take. And the reason for that is the more surface area, the quicker bacteria, invertebrates, all these different things, the fungi will break it down. So when you have it fine, and then you add in the nitrogen, which is gonna be your food waste, it's gonna be, if you're working with manures, uh, it's gonna be all these wet things that you add into there. These, and, and when I say wet, it's not like they're soaking wet. It's just like things that, that once had significant moisture to them, things that, that are high in nitrogen specifically. Once you add them in there, they're gonna be the catalyst to making that heat. So when you're working with meats and stuff like that, you wanna make sure that you have those really high temperatures because you need to kill that bacteria from happening. Um, when COVID started, that was one of the things that, that all the composters were freaking out about. Like, okay, what, what does this mean? Like, does it mean we're gonna to have to like watch out and all this, all this stuff? And, um, and then they found out pretty quickly that like, okay, if you're doing hot composting at your facility, short of you know people touching handles and passing things around your compost isn't really that big of a concern as long as you're doing it hot so the idea is the higher the heats for your compost the more it's going to kill off the stuff if you're doing those hot temperatures and you your compost still gets gets you sick like if if you still get sick from something from there there's bigger problems to worry about than the fact that you added something into your compost. There, there's a whole, oh my God, what the hell am I, what, what, what's brewing here, you know, that's, that's in nature, that's this resilience to, to heat. So um, how do you keep the heat? How do you, how do you turn the heat up in your compost? <laughs> so one way to do it is to aerate your pile. Um, a lot of people will use a pitchfork. I usually use a rebar or a pipe. If you use a pitchfork, you're gonna get stuck. It's gonna hurt your back. The reason you're, you're using a pipe or a pitchfork or whatever, you, the reason you're aerate, aerating your pile is because what I was saying earlier about oxygen being important. If you're doing that type of composting, 
you want oxygen in there to, to uh, oxygenate your bacteria. Basically, that is aerobic bacteria that's in your pile that's trying to breathe. If you don't give it that oxygen, it suffocates and it dies. But if you give it that oxygen by poking into the pile, then you're basically throwing in this, this, this uh, lifeline of oxygen that's, you know, it's just like in the movie where like, you know, they're, they get hit with like the, the scuba tank or whatever. And they're just like, and then, you know, they're back, they're back to business as usual, which isn't really how it works, but whatever. That's kind of how it works for the compost pile where this bacteria is on its last leg. You give it this oxygen and it's like a, a power up and then it starts breathing and it can start moving quickly and it can start doing its thing. The same thing you'll notice, um, the same way that like a pile outside can get s slow, your worm bin, when it gets really cold, will start getting slow. You know, the same way that like when it's cold outside, we start moving slow because it's just, you know, pain in the ass. It's the same thing for like the worms. Doesn't mean that they stop altogether. Traditionally, everywhere I read, that's what they say is that wintertime worms aren't doing jack. In reality, that's not true because I've, I've had below freezing weather and there would be like a tiny layer, basically skin on the, on the compost. And that's just the soil basically reacting the same way that like our skin reacts to, to the, the, um, the uh, air, the heat, all these different things to either stay, uh, you know, soft or gets dry and hard or brittle, or whatever your soil creates a skin as well. And the worms will be hiding inside that thing doing perfectly fine as long as there's that, that layer in there. Like I've had it where I cracked that open and the worms are just like totally chill and it was freezing outside. Um, but yeah, the oxygen is the way that you keep that, that pile going nice and hot. Or if you're working with, with animal manure, specifically uh, things that are traditionally herbivores, that's what you want to mess with. Anytime that you have anything that is uh, uh, an omnivore, so like, you know, humanure specifically, you can compost your poop. The problem is like, there's so many different types of diseases that can come out of that. You have to make sure one, it's really damn hot. And two, if you do it, you don't eat the plants that are being grown from that manure. Ideally, you're using that for ornamentals. You're using that for, for bushes and stuff like that around your house or for your park or whatever, for your trees. But if it's stuff that you're going to be consuming, I highly recommend not doing it. There are places that have got, you know, get away with doing it and they've been doing it for a very long time. But if, you, if it's just like you're doing it at home, it's, it's better safe than sorry. Because when you're, in this case, you can get very, very sick. Um, but if you're going to be doing like a ferment, uh, specifically like bokashi composting, which uh, bokashi means uh, fermentation in Japanese, um, it's basically a type of composting that was bitten from Korean uh, culture and, and doing composting and stuff. Um, that's specifically uh, stuff like, like in here where they're talking about Korean natural farming and fermentation. When you're doing fermentation, you can get away with some crazy stuff and it's because you have such a um a bacteria that's so voracious that like like I, i'm talking about like like when i first started doing composting it was in this bin right here and it was a simple bin that has these holes has a spigot to to drip it off and you throw the stuff in there you throw in the Bokashi bran, which is basically just bran that's been inoculated with anaerobic bacteria. So the stuff that I was talking about that doesn't require oxygen. And basically what ends up happening is fuzzy little stuff grows all over the, the plant material and it breaks it down really well. I mean, we're talking meats, bones, fish scales, vegetables, you know, you name it, this thing will metabolize the hell out of it. It takes a while to get it just right. But like once you do it, it I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a game changer. So, so, so basically, man, like the, for, for, there's different ways to speed up the, yeah. the decomposition process that, you know, is the core 
of composting. Like it, it really depends on what, you know, technique you use in order to really like get it as hot as possible and break that stuff and, and activate the bacteria that's actually going to eat that stuff that right. you're trying to decompose, right? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's talking about doing it with ferments. Um, to a degree, you're doing it with, with, wor with uh, fun fungi as well. Um, so like the stuff that we saw, we saw outside in the mulch pile, that was just a tiny little piece. But like when you get that set up, it turns into um, blocks. You know, it looks simple like this, like little strands. And then eventually those little strands, they get together and they make a solid. Mm. And that's what's also referred to as your growing substrate. Your substrate is the stuff that you are growing your fungi or, or you're using to, to grow whatever, um, whatever stuff that you are inoculating. Um, and yeah, I mean, So, 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 so tell me about the different techniques, man. You got, you, you, you talk, you, you said something about Bokashi method, yeah. you know, so, uh, verbal composting, hot yeah. composting, like give, like help people understand like what's the, what's the most accessible methods and then like rate them, like go up, like, you know what I mean? Start with the, the easy yeah. stuff and then like take them to a, a little bit more advanced. So if you're going to be doing stuff, like, especially if you're going to be doing stuff with like, uh, like your kids, if you're trying to do stuff, that's like real simple. If, if your household is on a vegetarian, uh, vegan diet, then I highly recommend doing vermicomposting. And this bin right here is, uh, I believe it's a 17 gallon. You really don't need that big a bin. Um, you can totally get away with like a five gallon bin. The worms that are in here, these are called red wigglers. Um, they, they do their thing. Uh, when you're looking at buying worms, the general rule of thumb is one pound equals 1,000 worms. When you're doing it for a household, worms eat, can eat their, their body weight per day if everything is right. So the same way that like, if I were to say, hey, I want you to eat, you know, two pounds of potatoes, if you don't feel like it, you don't feel like it. So the same thing happens with, with the, the worms and stuff where like, they have to be eating the right stuff. They have to be comfortable with the environment you're giving them. You can't be messing with them all the time. They have to be in a relatively shady area. You have to make sure the moisture level is just right. Like this, uh, um, the uh, so like this here, it's it's not soaking wet. It feels it feels like somebody kind of sneezed on my hand. Like it's a little bit sticky. Um, afterwards, if I were to shake somebody's hand, they'd be like, "Okay, what what have you been doing? Like that's disgusting." Like that, that's the general rule of thumb for composting is you want it to not be soaking wet, but you want a little bit of moisture in your pile. And that's going to help the bacteria. In this case, it's also going to help the worms because you, you don't want the worms to dry. And, and we're talking, and then when you're feeding them, the really important thing for the worms is that it's going to take them a while to be comfortable with the food. So when you're first doing it, you're going to get a little bit of food. You're going to throw it into here and then you're going to cover it. And then you're going to go the next, and this is a banana peel. It's breaking down. Then you're going to go the next day and dig another hole, put the food, and then you're going to cover it. And you're going to keep doing that over and over and over and over again. And keep notes, you know, observe as much as possible. What are they eating? How are they breaking it down? Why, why aren't they consuming this as quickly as I want them to? Then when you start seeing like, okay, I'm throwing stuff in and they're chewing it up, boom, there you go. Then you know that like your worms are on point, the temperatures are good, they're gonna bang stuff out there as quickly as possible. When you wanna harvest the, uh, the worm 
uh, compost as well, um, the vermicompost. This is a quick tutorial on how to do that. So you get, I mean, and this is this uh, coconut choir. So this isn't vermicompost yet. You get it, you do like this outside in the sun, whatever. And then you leave it there for like a good five minutes or so. And what's gonna happen is the worms, they're gonna go to the bottom because they're photosensitive. Then you're gonna get the pile, you're gonna get it, put it over here, put it over here. And then you look on the bottom and then you find where the worms are. You get them and you put them back into your bin and then you get the vermicompost and you use it. That's the easiest, safest way to do it without you know taxing your worms. You could try doing it with a sieve um, and you know all the more to you. But like, if you want something super simple that like, you know, it's not gonna be trying to reinvent the wheel, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and that's gonna be an easier form of composting. If you wanna do uh, something in your backyard, if you have space to do it, uh, I recommend getting a wire like, let's see if it comes out, wire like this. Um, it's gonna, this one is, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, it's, I think it's like 14 gauge or something like that, uh, wire. When you're buying wire for your compost bin, what I learned very, very early is you wanna spend a little bit of money because when you go to the box stores and they have the wire that's like seven bucks for like 50 feet or 20 bucks for like 50 feet, it sounds too good to be true because it's just like, wow, this is really cheap. But then when you use it, it starts coming apart and you have like wire. Oh, you're breaking up again, bro. Yo. Oh, no. So, see, all right. You're breaking up a little bit, but okay, now we're back. That's your bin? Yeah. Nice. Um, That's chicken wire now for folks that are going to go to Home Depot and try to do this thing. That's chicken wire. You go on the, uh, if you go to Lowe's, because we're not supporting Home Depot no more, you go to Lowe's and um, in the garden center, uh, you know, you go in the garden center at Lowe's and go to the area where they keep the fencing for pets. And they got the chicken wire there. Look, that that's that 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 uh that's easy to find. Um. So, and and even for there, I would I would get it if you're starting off. But Tractor Supply or any of like the uh, was it um Southern Harbor States? Freight. Or, yeah, yeah. Or Harbor Freight. I'm not sure if they'll if they carry wire. They might not. Like any, those places that have like livestock that's the kind of wire you want to get ideally because what i found is like with the the stuff that's like cheaper at the box stores the joints right here come off too easy and i've had it happen where i was like oh this is amazing like i got like all this wire for like nothing and then i start using it and like the wires like stabbing me in the eye when i start like trying to chop into the compost uh. so like so like this one here and this is this one's I think it costs like like a eighty bucks or something like that for like a hundred foot roll. This one's even cheaper. There's one that's even more expensive that like you could straight up climb on this with your boots and this shit isn't gonna budge. Like it's just it's built the the way that it's so like this here is welded. The other one is what's called, what's referred to as um uh god what is it? It's like laced or uh uh, woven uh, wire so when you when you put tension on it it holds up whereas this stuff here the bond eventually can start to wear out I mean here luckily it hasn't happened but yeah so like this is another type of work, doing it for your home and what I'm doing is on the bottom here I put at least uh, I want to say at least like two feet of mulch on the on here and luckily I had a pile of mulch in the backyard from uh, some some clear up, but if you have like just random ass leaves or branches broken up or or whatever, 
you just throw all of that stuff in the bottom. And the idea is that that's going to hold in place as long as possible. And as that's going to give oxygen that I was talking about earlier. So like all these little pockets that you see in here, that's really important because that means I'm not going to have to work as hard, give oxygen into this pile to feed the bacteria. If you don't do that, what ends up happening is everything just sinks down to the bottom and then you just have like basically a big sloshy mess. Whereas what happens is as it breaks down and it pushes into here, it's getting trapped on each of those little pieces of wood. And remember the mycelia that I was showing earlier, all this stuff hopefully has been myceliated uh, before coming into here. Like that's one of the things when I'm throwing stuff in here, I'm adding things in and that's also referred to as amendments. You throw that stuff in there and it's basically just like little growth bombs that you're throwing in there to make stuff really pop with life. So ideally, as this stuff is breaking down, it's also saying, oh, hey, hold on, I got this stuff in here that's gonna break you down even better. And yeah, so like this is one way to do it at home, especially if you're gonna be doing meats and vegetables, this way is gonna give you a lot more heat. Um, and yeah, and you know, occasionally you'll have like, you know, if you're not turning it all the time, you'll have pop-ups like this. Okay. Yeah, little, little volunteer. Hey, we are, we, we, yo, we are, we're at eight o'clock, man. You want to take a couple questions or how do you want to do it? Because we got a couple folks that have chimed in on here, throw a couple questions in it in here. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and scroll up to the top. See what we got. Um, we already talked about the compost and the meat. Um uh, Da, da, da. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, somebody was like, um, how long does the Bokashi last? You know what I'm saying? How long does the how, how long does the Bokashi last when we uh, remember we made the Bokashi with the group with one of the Gen Herbal Gardeners groups? Uh, yeah. how many how, how long would that 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 uh that that dose of Bokashi last? I mean, so that time we did the, uh, I'm trying to remember, did we do a liquid or, or did we do the, we did the brand, right? Yeah, we did the brand. Yeah. So like, <laughs> you can buy Bokashi that will be shelf stable for a while. The idea is because it's anaerobic and because of what it's doing, you want it to one, stay without oxygen until you're ready to use it. So if you're making the brand yourself, I mean, theoretically, if you have everything on point, um, I think you can technically get it up to like several months to a year stability. Like one oh, wow. of the things, that, one of the things that I'm doing right now, I believe so. One of the things that I'm doing right now, because that's the thing, the Bokashi brand that I, that I made, it came from this. Okay. And this is, this is lab. This is the lactic acid bacteria. This one has been added, uh, sh sugar has been added to it, molasses specifically. The reason the sugar is added there is you're doing what's called, um, was it hypersaturation of sugar? So like the same way that like when we have sugar and we, we crash afterwards, what you're doing is you're getting that lactic acid bacteria and you're adding in a shitload of sugar and the idea is you're breaking it, you're, you're basically, you're giving a sugar high that's gonna stop all the bacteria from working. That there's gonna be the ratio of, of water and sugar in there. Um, there's not gonna be any more water for them to consume and burp. There's just gonna be oh. sugar. Oh. When you do that and it's shelf stable, the liquid that you can do to make that Bokashi, that shit can last, I've heard people say like over a year. Wow. And that's my, that, that one is shelf stable. So like this one here that's, that goes, this has been in the refrigerator. This one isn't shelf stable, but from what I understand, um, it can last several months easily. And it doesn't smell, it basically smells like a really, like, it's like, it's like if you had mozzarella or something, the smell that your breath would have afterwards. It's, it's cheesy, but not like crazy. 
But then, you know, after it's been sitting for a while, I still got the bacteria in it probably a little bit, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. See, and that's the thing is that, like, it's all a case of, like, potency. So, like, like for the, the lactic acid bacteria, it's going to be very resilient if it's kept in, like, the right temperatures or if it has the right food in it, so the sugars to make it shelf-stable. And if you're adding that into whatever and you're letting it to, to multiply – then what's going to happen is it's going to multiply like crazy. It's going to it basically whatever you add it to is going to turn into, into an all you can eat buffet. So it's going to be like, boom, 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 boom with all this eating and multiplying and turning into, to a, a spread of stuff. So what can, what will start off is just as like, Oh, I'm spraying a little bit here or there. We'll turn into, let me see if I can get this picture. Um, yeah, well, stuff like this. Oh, wow. Um, where, where they're adding in different additives and bacteria, and all this stuff is getting really, really tight and funky and making lots and lots of connectivity. Um, this is one here, too, that I, I want to work with you in the next few months or so. This one's talking about making microorganisms on a local level. Uh, uh, in this in this case, um, they're using cedar boxes. I think there's cedar boxes or, or something like that. Ideally, people use cedar. Some people use like bamboo. All you're doing is you're throwing in uh, basically slightly cooked rice that's kind of sticky. You're throwing it into a box and you're letting it sit for five days to or so. And what ends up happening is all this bacteria that's local. Like when we're talking about local sustainability, this is it you've got all this, this bacteria all over the place that goes, oh, look, I want to eat this stuff. They go on that thing. They start eating it, the rice specifically. S simple starches, sugars, and then it goes from being this kind of sticky rice to all of a sudden it has this fuzz and it's hyphae and it's bacteria and it's all these different things that are exactly in your neighborhood. One of the things that, that got raised um, when I was listening to a, a podcast uh, is the stuff that I was showing you earlier in the, in the, the jar that I used uh, in the store-bought container. As, as easy as it is for us to use like bacterial inputs and stuff like that, one of the big things to ask is, where does that come from? So, we, same, so, so you're saying like if I got leftover rice that's yeah. been in the refrigerator for, mm -hmm. I don't know, it – like say 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 it's it's, it's past its leftover deadline, yep. right? Yep. Yep. I could take that rice, throw it in my compost, and it's going to activate, you know, the fungal networks inside of the um, inside my compost too. Potentially. Or, potentially. Potentially. What I would say is to put it in a small container and let it sit out and grow the bacteria onto there, and then wow. add that. Nice. Can you do the same thing with pasta? You think? Spaghetti, I Maybe haven't it's an experiment. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, it doesn't mean you can't. I mean, if we're talking about like, we're we're talking about basic starches, trying not to make it complex. Yeah, there, because huh. that, that's want to make it so. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying like, hey, lactic acid bacteria, I have something over here you're really gonna like, and then it's gonna go, oh my god, I want to eat that stuff. Or you're saying, hey, uh, actinomyces uh, bacteria. I have something over here that I want you to get. And then it's going to jump to it. The, one of the things that people will do when they're making this, this rice box is they will look specifically for uh, parts of their uh, property or farm space or whatever that has like uh, trees that have fallen or piles of leaves and they'll throw it on the box. So they'll throw it around the box. And basically the reason you're doing that is because those leaves are breaking down because something's breaking them down. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh, you've got rice. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to eat that rice. Right. And I'm going to, and I'm going to inoculate that rice. All right. So, 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 okay. So, so we got thermocomposting. We got uh, your outdoor compost wire bin. Then you got the Bokashi method where you're actually making your mic, making your bacteria or you're yeah. cultivating your bacteria, I should say. Uh, are there any other techniques that you would, you know, 
uh, yeah. recommend throwing out there? Yeah. So like, if you're gonna, if if you really like uh, mushrooms, you know, fungi and all that stuff, there's a really good book to to go with. Um, this is gonna be like if you have. Uh, so like the what I was showing outside was uh, there were some stumps that were covered in mushrooms. If you have stuff like that for land management that you're trying to get rid of that you're just like, damn, like it's going to cost you several thousand dollars to break down or you could inoculate it and it could break down into something for your yard. Mm. And that's add in the mushrooms. And it can be as simple as, you know, you're finding those, those spores, the, the mycelia rather that was in that pile over there and you're mixing it around your garden so that all of a sudden they'll start flourishing. Or it could be that you get like the tiny little uh, plugs of mushrooms that you can purchase and you put them into wood and you inoculate them and you seal them up with, with wax and then they basically start to bloom and they eat stuff. That's a type of composting. Um, you know, fung fungal composting is, is a valid type of compost. It's not gonna do breakdown of like food and stuff like that. But at the same time, if you have like a bunch of fallen trees around your house, that stuff's a pain in the ass to take care of. And the one option is if, if you can afford it, you can have someone remove it for you. Or you could look at that, that stuff that's around your house and be like, okay, I'm going to grow something from that. I'm going to make a Hugo culture out of that. I'm going to make fungus out of that. I'm going to do all these different things out of everything that's around me. I mean, that, that's one of the big things with composting is that like you start – you start being a pack rat. Like you're just like, okay, why am I throwing this away? What's, what's the second, third, fourth, fifth use of this product, you know, and you start getting all these different things and reusing them as much as possible. How many, um, how many, uh, uh, buck, uh, well, well, what's some, what's some common things that people can grab up to, to start their compost. I, I, I'm always recommending people getting buckets, uh, yeah, so you know, the five gallon totes. Yeah, so if you do like the five gallon totes, um, you can start with, you know, a few worms in there, a, like a handful or two of worms. You can make your own uh, systems where you're, you're making like the, the worm chalets or the, the worm castles, whatever, where you're, you're making it so that there's holes and they, they can move in there. Basically, one bucket's going to be food, another one's going to be drainage, and then you're going to keep moving stuff around. You're going to have like three buckets. And you're, you're going to have like a rotating system. Um, the other thing is like, if you can get your hands on the 55 gallon drums, uh, some places get rid of them for free. Some places you got to pay for them. You mean like or, rain barrels? Yeah, the rain barrels. Whenever you get those, always, always, always ask what was in this. The same way that like you have to be careful with the uh, treated wood for the pallets you got to be careful with those barrels too, because some of those barrels, they're technically food grade, but they can have some nasty stuff inside of them. And if somebody doesn't know what was previously in them and they're like, I don't know, and here you go, don't use them because I've, I've had an occasion where they were really cheap and they had, um, they had uh, windshield wiper fluid. And when I researched the company, ah, Holy shit. Yeah, when I <laughs> that it came from they were like don't touch it don't drink it don't be exposed to it don't do all these things and i was just like bro like you're selling this and you have no idea what it was holding like and the guy who was selling it to me was like oh yeah i use it for for water barrels for my house and i'm like oh my god you're gonna die horribly from this you know what I mean? oh, shit. <laughs> and, but the, the shit of it is like when i was researching it it was like this tiny, very important paragraph on this entire website that was like, you will die. <laughs> this is toxic, bro. Yeah. <laughs> if I go around and hurt yourself. Right. Um, tell, tell, uh, uh, tell, tell some folks about the, uh, some methods, some easy methods that they can keep oxygen inside of their outdoor uh, yeah. uh compost because I think more, a lot of people are probably going to lean towards that method you know what I mean but that's just me you know what I mean so what's yeah. some techniques that you could do to add to keep the oxygen without having to like overexert yourself with your turning and all that stuff branches all, all so basically if, if you have like if you have twigs and branches all around your house that you're just like 
I can't stand dealing with it. Make one day where you just do nothing but that. You throw all that stuff on the bottom of your pile and that's going to make work for you so much easier. And the thing is, when you eventually take apart that pile, when you take apart that, that bin to harvest, anything that's not broken up, you're going to take it out and you're going to scoop it to the side and then that's going to go to your next bin. Because what's happened is the same way that you want to inoculate that rice, the same way you want to inoculate that milk, the same way you want to inoculate all these things, that material that isn't broken up has been hit with all the bacteria, all the fungi, all the, all the different things that are working to break it down. They've been doing it all that time. They haven't broken it down yet. But like when you're talking about like, oh, I want to buy like a starter kit. When you buy like compost starter kits, some of those I've seen just the starter kit, like 30, 40 bucks. And like in many cases, yeah, that's, that's important stuff. But some of them are just like, just throw compost in there. Like just find a friend who does compost and find a neighbor who does this stuff. There, there are certain strands that are very strong that will help go for, for very particular things like lactic acid bacteria and stuff like that for really powerful stuff. But if it's just like, you know, quote, compost starter kit, it, it really shouldn't be charged that much because what it is, is, is just, I mean, if you peed into a jar and then dumped it onto your compost, that's technically a starter kit because what's happening is you have a one-to-one -one ratio of nitrogen and that's going to be, that's tons and tons and tons and tons of nitrogen added into there. If you added that onto a pile of hay, boom, it's, it's breaking down that hay. Wow. So, pee, so if you're doing straw bale gardening, pee on your pee on your hay bales. As long as you're not near a school and you know you don't have neighbors that are people. Like, <laughs> I got a homie that that peed on his compost on a, or, or took pee and put it on his compost, and uh, yeah, he had a really great harvest. <laughs> I mean that you know the, if anything, that's going to be a simpler way of doing it. And at, and at the same measure, if you were to get that same that same urine and add water to it, now it's no longer one to one ratio. Now it's it's more balanced. Now you've got a nitrogen soil amendment. You know, if 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 you get those pH levels just right, I mean, you could be feeding that to your roses. Right. You know. You, um, you know, it's it's all about like balance and what what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes it's not even a case of like, oh, well, like if you go ahead and do like this, it's going to work every time. That's, the th that's one of the number one things for composting is that you're going to have failure, you're going to learn from it, and you're going to do something about it. Because what ends up happening is there's too many, just as in life, there's too many people that want to know how do I do it without fail. And the thing is, that's gardening, that's composting, that's anything you can think of, anything you can apply, there's going to be failure. The important thing is how do you learn from that failure and make it as productive as hell? You know, I hear people like get caught up. They be like, oh, you know, I got to put three parts nitrogen and, you know, one part, you know, carbon. I got to put three parts carbon. You know what I mean? Like they, they do these ratios with the, with the thing. And then I, I think for a lot of folks, that paralysis of analysis sets in because it's like, holy shit, I'm not how, – how do I know how many – browns you know how many greens you know what i mean right i mean for me personally in my composting scenario you know i just toss it i just toss it. i got barrels in my backyard you know what i mean that i cut open and i drill some holes in the bottom of them and i just i just toss it you know what i'm saying in it and i don't really be thinking about like oh but i mean when it starts getting like really weird with the flies and shit then i'm like okay let me go get some uh some newspaper or some old cardboard or yeah i mean i'm throw some stuff in there just to kind of like balance out the wetness because i mean i got a lot of food scraps in there so let me throw some carbon in there but i don't really be like meticulous with it you know what i'm saying so i mean my, i'm a lazy composter right you know what i'm saying <laughs> i ain't got time to be turning shit all the time man <laughs> One of the things that I've been learning gradually with like the, the Korean natural farming where they go for, so like what I traditionally would have been like, nah, this is like way too funky. I got to dump it out or I got to do whatever. 
a lot of the method there is no, let it go. Let it keep getting funky. Because like, like for instance, um, when you're making uh, fish amino acids, basically what you're doing is you're getting fish guts. You're getting fish. You're getting leftover fish. You're jamming it into a jar. You're putting, I think it's equal parts sugar to how much fish you put in there, putting in water, and you're letting that shit sit for months. The same stuff that we throw onto, um, that we have like in stir fries, like the, the, you know, the, the fish oil and stuff like that, that's really dark and funky. Right. It got to that level because it sat for a very long time. When you make this stuff yourself, you can either use it for your food or you can use it to grow your food. So like there's some people who will make the fish and they'll, they'll use it in their garden or they'll use it in their stir fry or, or whatever food that they want to be doing. And that's basically just looking at like, how can I make something like, that's one of the things that they've, they've learned in Korean natural farming is that like, when you let stuff get really funky, nasty, and, and just concentrated like that, you start getting like really high levels that at the same time, when we go to like the store or, or whatever, they're like, Oh yeah, you know, like, you know, it's got like this much, uh, um, NPK. It, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are, are just one fucking tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the equation. Right. Bacteria, insects, fungi, all these different things. Those are what you want. The, the funk of soil is what you want. You don't want this absolutely perfect thing that like, you know, the same way that like, you're not going to survive off of protein shakes all day long. Like you got to add in fiber, you got to add in nutrients, you got to add in all these different things. It's the same shit for your for your garden, for your compost. Sure it is. needs all the different added into there in order to thrive. And that's one of the things that they found with like these really concentrated ferments, where like they get like we're talking like fucking like banana peels in like a jar, and you're getting like really high ratios. And the thing is, not only are you getting concentration, but you're getting it in a in a liquid volume. A, a, a liquid um, serving that's easier for your plant to metabolize. So it's just like, wait, okay, I could throw it away or I could compost it or I could stick it in a jar and boom, you know, I got to wait like three to six months, but I'm going to have this crazy stuff that when I feed it to my plants, my plants are going to be like, oh my God, why have you not been giving me this all along? Like, like when we're talking about like, you know, how to, to feed your plant, how to give all these things. And, and that's, that's the reason why, like, I'm showing all these different things is because there is no perfect way. If anything, there's a perfect way for your house, for your right. basement, for your garden. It's all yeah, about you, cherry picking. You remind me of, uh, you talking about the liquid, uh, the liquid soluble. It reminds me of, uh, Jizza, uh, uh, from Wu Tang, he was like um, the liquid soluble that made up the chemistry, <laughs> gaseous element that burned down your ministry. Urban wafer is a biblical paper smoke of Exodus. Every square of the yard was plush. <laughs> I'm sorry, I as as I got to throw a little something in, in that in that mix. That that's my jam though. That's uh mystery of chess box. Uh, no, uh, in that mystery of chess box, I think so. Uh, I can't remember. And and what he's talking about there most likely is he's referring to like the, there's the biblical reference of um, uh, you get like a ram's horn. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that was Duel of the Iron Mike, my bad. Anyway, yeah. look, we're on a tangent. So let's yeah. bring it back. Uh, yeah. Thought. But, but the idea, idea there is that they're making a concentration inside of a very tiny thing, a, a horn. And they're letting it sit for a long time. I mean, this is stuff that was like you know, way back then, BC, people are just like, okay, this is how we grow shit. Like, you add the thing into the ground, you let it sit, and then boom, you get really healthy stuff. Yo, so um, you made me think of something right there. So, you know, when we talk about uh, composting, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times people like, I try to parallel it, man. Like for folks, it's like you go in the forest, 
nobody's nobody's picking up the leaves in the forest. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's nobody that goes through the forest and rakes up all the leaves. Right. You know what I'm saying? Puts them in bags. You know what I'm saying? And takes them somewhere else. Like in a forest situation, I mean, leaves fall, they decompose, right. break down. It just it just it consistently happens. You know what I'm saying? So like being in rhythm with that, with your own composting methods, is like thinking about like how how can I do less work? You know what I'm saying, and not and not be stressed out. I will say this though, I did. We 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 tried to we tried to uh, get fish guts from the uh, from the fish market, <laughs> and we put it in the compost, and that shit stunk, boy, man. <laughs> it was a it was a horrendous. It was a horrendous hit. <laughs> and I got neighbors, so I had to, like, we had to, like, not do that. <laughs> so, so, so think about it like this, though. What if you left it there? What would happen? That people would have called, called, they would call people on us. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you would have got flies. Right. Flies are pollinators. Mm -hmm. They would have been buzzing around your pile. Yeah. Okay. Birds would see them, and they would eat them, and they're pollinators. Right. And you get other insects who go after flies. Right. They would eat them. They're pollinators. And then now, like now, there's a whole market um, of what's called frass. Frass is just insect shit. Oh so wow! We're, yeah. We're talking millipedes. We're talking um, uh, 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 roly polies. Uh, what's grasshoppers. That? Yeah, grasshoppers. You know, and, and this is stuff that, like, before, I was just like, cool, it's in the compost, whatever. But now they're, like, breaking it down and being like, okay, this one, the same way that worms have a particular type of feces of manure that works really well based on bacteria in their stomach, these other insects seem to have other parts to them that are just as important. And something needs to attract them, whether it's going to be the funk from the fish or whatever's breaking down in your pile or the fact that like it's an open bin or whatever, like th the part of the thing is the same way that we don't want lawns because they're monotonous, the practical application of them in the United States is unsustainable and, and it's a monoculture. When you're doing uh sister planting or you're doing permaculture or you're doing bokashi or you're doing composting or you're doing you know whatever form of of like gardening um that's that's funky that's that's dirty that's that's quote natural you know all these different things you're you're disrupting the mono and you're going for it being inclusive it, yeah, inclusive as possible. You're you're drawing in all these different things. You're you're bringing in different funky things. You're making community in your garden. Like the same, you know. And that's what I get back to is that it's like the same way that like it's much better when we have a big diverse community. The same thing happens for compost because if your compost is just like this plain bland shit that's just like same thing all day long, like okay, you might be making a lot of stuff. But like, is it good? Like, right. is it cool? Like, right. all the there? It's the same way that like some people will, will get, some people prefer certain compost from other compost. Some people prefer certain soil from other soils. Some people prefer, like, there, there's clearly a difference in quality and quality, quality begets growth. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like all compost not being equal is like your inputs will determine your outputs. So if you're only composting bananas, you know what I'm saying, then you're going to have lots of potassium inside of your compost. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you got to think about all of the – how do you get as many different nutrient sources inside right. of it as possible. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's that's clear, especially with the trace minerals too. Yeah. Uh, how do you get the trace minerals inside of it? It's, 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 a, it's a really important question. I mean, and, and, and the easiest answer I have for that is like, you know, make your own lab, you know, make your own compost tea, all these different things that you can add liquid to. And then boom, let's say you're doing hydro. Now you feed that into there instead of, 
instead of it being like, okay, I bought this product and it's coming from the other side of the country or, or it has like these particular facets in there. Like some of that stuff is great, but at the same time, if you can make the thing yourself, you know, it's going to take a while to get there. But then once you get it, that's the most sustainable way because like there isn't shipping, there isn't containers. It's, it's your backyard and your plant, you know, it's, it's your, your backyard or your, your office and the warehouse space that you're using. It's, it's like as localized as humanly possible, as localized in, in the purest sense. Right. So, um, you got any, yeah, oh, low. what's your recommended reading? I see you got some books over there. Go ahead and share some of that recommended reading with folks and yeah. we're going to figure out how to close this out. We are, we're almost at eight thirty. Okay. So <clears throat> this I refer to, you know, without getting burned out of Richmond, like this is the compost Bible. Yeah. Like, this has all the things. This like you want to get nerdy this has it you want to get blunt this has it you want to get whatever like it, it really is in, in every sense of the nature of nature it has all the things you want to know um if you want to get into the biology part and get really geeky into that and like figure out how to to get into the science i highly recommend this one mm -hmm. If you want to get into the fungi and how the mushrooms work, how the connections work. And this was a book that came out before all this started getting popular about the trees communicating with each other and the plants communicating with each other. This talks about a lot of that stuff. It shows like, especially if, if you have kids or, or if you're just like bored as hell and you want something to do, it has some really cool projects that you can do in here including getting um, uh, mushroom imprints where basically you get a piece of glass, you stick a mushroom on there that that's been freshly picked and the spores come off of it and boom, you got art. Oh, wow. Um, want to get into, like, I don't know how the hell people aren't selling this like crazy because the, the prints that they make from this are really dope. Um, and it's, it's stupid simple. I mean, like, uh, let me show, there it is. Like all that is is a mushroom sat there and this and the mushroom did its thing. It was like, oh, I'm gonna make more mushrooms. And it happened to be on a piece of paper or on a piece of glass. And then wow. boom. Wow, that's fascinating. If if you wanna go get into like how to do this stuff from your backyard, I mean this dude gets into like how to make your own soaps, how to make your own pesticide, how to make your own herbicide, and it's just using nothing but plants and all this shit that's growing around you. And just fermenting it and getting it funky and concentrated. Some of it is like more technical stuff with that, like you really need to be careful with as far as mixtures go. But then some of it's like this, like potatoes that you've cooked, you stick it in a bag and you just knead it until it gets mushy. I mean, it's just like really simple stuff that like it's been multiplied and magnified and tested and prodded and all the it's been through the the, the loops mm, word and it, and, you know and it's shit that's been like going on for for you know generations but i mean it, it's a case of like what we're taught you know you right. need to have a nice green yard you need to go to the grocery store and get all these things you need to have all these other things you need to have nice clean fingers you can't smell like this you need like this is all stuff that like it's pushing away from, from doing, doing the thing. Um, if you want to get into how to make energy from your compost, I highly recommend this one. It's got a coffee stain on there. Um, this one's talking about making energy, thermodynamic energy from your compost bin to your garden. Like if you want to be doing gardening 360 inside your bed, do this one or inside your greenhouse, do that one. If you want to grow like some tropical stuff without having to get solar power, I highly recommend that one. Mm. Uh, this one goes over some stuff with worms. I'm not crazy about all of it. I mean, for any of these things, like these are really good sources to start with, but more important, doing the damn thing yourself. That's because it. read it as much as possible, but until you actually see it being done, 
then you get that aha moment where it's like, okay, now I understand what they're talking about. Like it needs to be damp, not soaking wet, or it needs to smell like earth. Now I know what that smells like, or it needs to have like a sweet smell, not funky. Now I know, or it needs to have a funky smell. Now I know what that smells like. Like it, it'll get to the point where like you will smell, you'll be by your bin. You'll be like, Oh, that's kale. That went bad. Or, Oh, that's fish. Or like, like you'll just start walking around the city and you'll start smelling nasty stuff. And you'll be like, Oh, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> um, Yo, Bruno, you're 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 a freaking genius, man. Um, we at eight twenty nine. How can people get in contact with you? Uh, don't uh, you do compost? Don't 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 you do uh, compost pickups from people's homes too? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we we've moved into doing residential uh, over the past year as well as commercial still. Um, and you can go on uh, basically uh, contact me directly through the. Um, website um trying to update that stuff so that it'll be even more streamlined uh the instagram page is another uh easy way to do it uh the facebook page is a little it's it's a pain in the yeah um but uh but yeah like if anything i'm trying to get it as widespread as possible if if people want to go in on it together like i'm totally down for doing like community composting stuff like 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 we did at McDonough. Um, I've been even throwing around the idea of like doing like shared bins for like uh, apartment complexes and stuff like that, or, or communities that are just like, you know, we'd rather have like, like our own compost dump, but, right. but not, not the same idea of going to a landfill. Right. Um, you know, just trying to make it as easy as possible. We'll also do um, like if people want it for their homes, um, I'm working on making some wireframe bins that will be easy that you will get your wireframe bin. You'll get a bunch of leaves that have, uh, been inoculated with stuff. Um, you'll get a burlap bag. Like you'll, ha you'll have as many of the ingredients, the dry ingredients as you need to then get kicking with, with your side of it from adding in your food waste. Like I'm, that, that's the whole thing is that like, if it's not simple, then people aren't going to do it. And if people want it to be complicated, then I can give them complicated. But like the whole idea is we need to get everybody on board. Like if, if, if everybody isn't doing it, then what's the point? Right. <clears throat> so, yo, man, uh, what's your website? Compost. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Compost. .com. Yep. And what's your Facebook? I mean, uh, what's your Instagram? Uh, all so Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all compost RVA. Sweet. Yo, any last words, final thoughts, inspirations, something that you want to, what's your rally cry? <laughs> Everybody got a chant right now and protesting and shit. What's your, what, what's your, what's your compost channel? What, what's your, uh, what's your, what's your, uh, a days or something? What's your final, yeah. final thought? I mean, so it, it was kind of like what, it, what I was bringing up every once in a while is that like, Composting effectively is what we're striving for. The more people involved, the more diversity there is, the hotter, the more efficient, the better, the healthier it's going to be for everybody. And we're talking about personal health from the bacteria that's in the compost that actually helps with stress levels. We're talking about garden health which helps us grow better things that comes right back into the personal health that makes us healthier for eating them in the first place. If we're not making that loop as easy and healthy as possible, then things are going to continue the way that they are. Yeah. Word. All right, man, this was dope. I think we did a good job. All right. So, uh, I'm going to check in with you later, man. I got some stuff that I want to talk to you about. Uh, yeah. but, um, thank y'all for tuning in to the live. Yeah, I'm saying this is seemed like it was a good hit. We got a good little flow. Uh, and um, I'm going to try to see if we can get this uploaded somewhere so you can ch check it out again at another time on like YouTube or something like that. But it's now live on Facebook. And we're here with Bruno Welsh, Ron Chavis, Brother Manifest. Peace and blessings. Y'all enjoy your evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you, bro.